Hi everyone and welcome to this talk on enhancing citizen services by automating and harmonizing data and processes uh, with Guti Agraharam. So um, citizens look for a seamless and simple experience when they interact with the public services, something I like to call a kind of slippy, slippy contact. Um, however, despite the significant investments in data over the last decade, underlying processes remain complex and intertwined, undermining the user experience that better data and connectivity uh, could have provided. So our speaker today, Guti, will explore the tools and methods that are bridging this gap and unlocking that value through automation and also harmonizing data and processes. So um, a little bit of housekeeping, uh, your cameras and microphones are muted, but we would like you to interact with us in the chat. And also if you have any questions uh, for our speaker at the end of the session, do please put them into the Q&A tab and uh, we'll respond to them before, before we finish today. So our speaker is Guti Agraharam. He's head of intelligent process automation, Amir at Cognizant. And in this position, position he sorts clients, supports clients navigate and scale their automation and digital transformation journeys. He's got over 25 years of experience. Uh, he's an MCA award-winning industry leader He's worked with clients on large systems integration, program management and transformative consulting projects from Asia, Europe and the Americas. So Guti, you're incredibly welcome. I love the background you've got today. Um, the floor is yours. I look forward to hearing what you're going to share with us. Right, Robin, thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I, I think I realized uh, I'm competing with the lovely sunshine outside my window that I'm looking at. And thanks for all your time this afternoon to uh, understand what uh, we're looking at a very interesting topic around data and processes. It's very interesting, uh, uh, Robin, when he introduced me, he talked about my background, but I, I would say that one of the most exciting times I had uh, my learning was when I spent uh, as a senior partner working for a, another leading firm as a senior partner for public sector and the impact that we could make to the citizen services, I mean, largely across sectors. And uh, the value we bring compared to the commercial sector work that we do and most of my career has been around that. So with that said, let me kind of uh, bring today the context of what we are trying to uh, talk about. Data and processes are like uh, uh, two sides of the coin for, for us to kind of get the value out of what we are trying to deliver. Either it's a citizen experience or it's a customer experience or any user experience. And my uh, uh, next few minutes of the discussion is around how do uh, different organizations look at it? Where are they in this journey? How do we bring it all together? And why it's so critical and important to bring data and processes together to deliver best outcomes for a, a citizen service or a great uh, experience for the citizen services. With that said, if I can just move on to the next slide. Well, so this is the layout. Uh, sorry, just go back to the last one. Thank you. So this is the structure of my presentation. So today, uh, talking more about what drives customer citizen experience. What are the core elements of data and process? Why do they need to come together? And what are the building blocks to bring them together? What are some of the use cases that we work with our clients? We work and we have seen in the industry where they're leveraging the components of the building blocks that we will talk about. And most interestingly, I think, how do we kind of uh, drive this in your respective organization and what value uh, uh, does this integrated data plus process view bring together? So that's kind of what I have to cover. And then we got a few question and answers. Please feel free to ask your questions, post it in chat as and when you see any interesting slides so that we can pick up and answer them as we go along. And if I can go to the next slide. So I think as I just said the context, um, it brings a smile to my face. I mean, it's not necessarily my favorite color of the car, but um, when we look at uh, experience, whether it's a citizen experience or the user experience, it feels like most of the organizations have spent a lot of time and effort in building the best car. In this case, the analogy that I would like to draw upon is it's all about the data and the user experience within the car. However, what organizations and uh, uh, departments have not done is unlocking the processes. To me, the traffic kind of symbolizes the whole traffic and the 
processes within the organization. So you kind of got a really nice, funky new car, but you're not able to progress and have the best experience of the car because you spent so much money and time on that, but didn't worry about the infrastructure, which in this case is the process infrastructure. So I thought I'll start with a kind of an analogy here. So what's important to get the best of best experience for this uh, investments in your data is to ensure that you also understand the wider ecosystem of processes and unlock them so that you can have the best in class experience. So with that said, if I can just move to the next slide. Right. So uh, this is a survey done recently, but um, what's interesting to know is I think we are not alone. I mean, what, what's interesting is I want to take a view about where United Kingdom is with respect to other industries. What this graph depicts is how is the top performing industry benchmarking the public services satisfaction in terms of citizen engagement versus their engagement with corporates, which it could be corporates could vary as, uh, as much as you know, uh, anything to do with the apples and the Googles of the world. And then to kind of turn it around to uh, experience that we deal with our mobiles or we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with any corporates for any services that we deal with versus what we deal in the world of uh, uh, public sector, whether any department that you uh, deal with, whether it's pensions or with the HMRC or with your local bodies. So you could see that there's a huge delta um, as much as we are not alone, not necessarily the best picture to showcase saying, are we at least leading the world? Not necessarily. So where exactly are the challenges? So if you can continue with the next, uh, next slide. What has happened is uh, most of the organizations or departments have invested significantly into the uh, experience uh, design, which is uh, either the investment in uh, data, is the investment in the user experience, or look and feel of how the services should look like. It's kind of, I don't necessarily use like this analogy, but lipstick on a pig kind of a thing explains the whole metaphor around why we think, you know, user experience just at the top is great, but if you can double click further on Allah, the mess around the processes and data at the back end are quite intertwined. As much as there's a significant investment that's gone into the front end, what has happened in the back end of how we bring it all together? There's a lot of uh, interlinking between various processes, the data, and resulting in a very choppy, frustrating experiences, which really lacks operational agility. So what you have in the front end is a lovely swanky, either a portal or a mobile app. But to get the same experience, you also need to unlock the back end spaghetti and that has been uh, interlocked over a period of number of decades where departments have invested in data or processes through a number of different iterations and you know trying to get the best experience will require unlocking of this and what we're going to talk in the next few slides is about how do we construct this how do we unlock this whole uh, spaghetti and then make it simplified so that the user experience continues to be best in class and how we bring the automation fabric into this whole discussion so that this simplifies number one and then exploits the investments that you've already made either in the data or in the process domain. So that's the kind of core of what we would like to discuss and explain what are the fundamental building blocks? How do we unravel? I mean, it's quite messy. Looks like a big hairy uh, transformation project, but can we simplify and construct this and deconstruct this to so that the end user experience or citizen experience are simplified. If I go to the next slide, it gives you some statistics around uh, some of the survey. This is interesting. There's a number of numbers here. I'll just call your attention on two or three key areas. What's interesting is we try to get the latest survey on this, but nothing much has changed. This is a survey that's been about six years ago. We tried to pull something from the past saying, what is citizens experience with the public services? I mean, specifically, do they feel empowered? Do they have control on what, what they really get? You see that, uh, you know, significant number, the 63 and 55% basically uh, tells you the demographics as well as the frustration on the fact that we have very little control on what we receive as much as we are the taxpayers and the helplessness around what controls do we have and how I want this experience of interacting with the public bodies better than what we anticipate today. However, um, there's a huge scope for improvement. Six years later, as I said, the survey was done about six years ago, but even if we were to replicate the survey now, fundamentally, we don't believe things have moved, the needle has significantly moved, maybe a few percentage points, 
there's a huge opportunity here for each of the department to bring together the data and the process so that you can have a fast car really delivered, having the best experience that we can take forward. The other interesting uh, stat on the specific uh, slide is the top uh, right one. The 32%, what we look at is saying, uh, also saying that we would like to engage with the political party, I mean, which I don't want to wield into that part of the domain, but it also has an impact on the wider governance, saying that citizens do believe that you know, the best facility and the experience of public services has an inkling towards which political party they would probably vote to power. So I think all in all, a number of stats on this slide, but two, three key messages. One is better empowerment so that they have better control, availability of, uh, and may, uh, availability of information when and when they need, when and where they need. And the last and the most important thing is how can citizens participate in this whole transformation. And I think those are the three key messages I would like to leave you with. How do we achieve this? I think there's, there's a lot that has gone in. Sorry, just go to the next slide, that's fine. There's a lot of investments in the, if you see this again, um, we talked about the data and process are the kind of two sides of the same coin to deliver best customer experience. What's really critical is across uh, a number of different programs right now that are being undertaken across various departments, a number of missions being run in the last couple of years. Some of you probably are private to the slide. The data strategy has taken center uh, uh, center of attention right for the, for the right reasons. A significant amount of focus on how each of the mission has invested into the value chain, either it's a security or to drive the efficiency and sharing of information between the different uh, departments. However, what has happened is as much as the data has now started getting refined and the ability to exchange the information between different departments has kind of started getting very close to where it needs to be. There's still the journey to be traversed there. What is interesting is there's never been a national process strategy. I would call it national uh, unified strategy around what, how do we make this process better? You got the best cars now, but you don't have the best roads. So how are you going to get the best experience? So I think that transformation mindset is something that we've strongly believed needs to be brought into the public services domain for us to continue to kind of drive value uh, for the investments that have been already made into the into the each of the departments around data so to continue to capitalize on the best investments made in the data area processes and uh, making sure that the processes are riding on the backbone a very strong uh, technology backbone surrounded by the digital architecture will drive the best in uh, class value for, for our citizens and for the customers. So moving on from here. All right, a bit of a busy slide, but let me, let me kind of try to, uh, try to number some of the key blocks here, but to just to draw your attention, not necessarily in the order of priority. If you typically look at any enterprise, any department, there's been a lot of investments in the last many, many years over the core enterprise software around cloud, around APIs, around the CRM systems, the core workflow case management systems. What we kind of you know, uh, try to say is this is the foundation, foundation layer, which I think is fine, working well. Yes, there can be a scope for improvement. However, for us to kind of get the best out of this process and data value together, there are a number of smaller elements for this jigsaw puzzle that need to come together. So let me start explaining each of them and um, delve a bit deeper. So the democratization of low code and no code platforms. So what has happened is the data has continued to remain in this core enterprise systems, but there is no orchestration layer through either a low code or through a core integration layer. But, and that's been built either through a combination of APIs, microservices, or a common enterprise service bus, which is an old school way of integrating. There've been some work that has been done in this area, but that democratization of these platforms to enable the data flow seamlessly between the various data silos is really critical. And that allows exploiting the data for each of the departments, whether it's their own internal data or the data from the third party systems to enable an a, a experience that is required for the uh, citizens. The second area, the customer experience, the user experience strategy, that's actually quite critical as well. As we talked about it, you may have the best process and the data, but the look and feel, the ease of 
uh, capturing that information is very critical. So the investment on uh, customer in the user experience and the citizen experience in this case becomes one of the core pillar for this strategy. The third big block, which I think we probably already stated it a number of times, and I don't want to state the obvious again, is ensuring the core uh, data, master data layer, which is about the quality of the customer data, which is quite critical. I think there've been a lot of investments again in this area, either on the master data management or on the data warehousing strategy, but data forms one of the core pillar of how we bring this all together. On the back of this, the investments in analytics or you know the machine learning and artificial intelligence which is about you got data which in its own world doesn't exist but it needs a context and how do you bring the context and how do you make sense of the data to provide the information right inside so you can continue to improvise on on the experience so that that forms the other fourth copilla and the last and the most important thing is the automation and workflows, I think this is really, really critical. The reason why we say this becomes very critical is because one, we talked about the process infrastructure that's required. Number two, a number of these tasks, which don't necessarily need to be humanly driven, not just because of efficiency, but more from an experience and the quality of the data that needs to move with a less error rate and more effective risk management becomes the fourth and the fifth and the most uh, final ingredient in this whole jigsaw puzzle. Obviously, this, this is surrounded by the huge change management and governance and, and uh, customer-led uh, what we call discovery and mining and advisory work. But there's a more the services wrapper around it. But from a technology perspective, these five are core foundation layers on the top of your existing core enterprise systems, which need to come together, interweave, and provide the best in class information, the fingertips of the agents who are providing services to our customers or to the applications which are providing services to the citizens. And they become very, very critical in this whole customer citizen journey into play. Uh, there have been traditional schools, which I think say that design led strategy, design led thinking unlocks the whole customer journey and the value stream mapping, which we continue to use in this world to identify the hotspots and how do we kind of optimize between the various different layers. But this five layers, I mean, there are a few more that we can add to the table, but they become the foundational layers to kind of come together to offer any kind of a variation in the use case, whether it's a standard use case or the extreme complex use case. But these four or five layers are more than more than sufficient, I would say. Obviously, there could be something else um, in the overlay of cloud, et cetera, but I think that's more a way of how we deliver the services. But these are like five critical ingredients I would call to make the best, uh, best dish to deliver the customer experience. I want to bring this to life, not just talk about them. So how do these each individual pieces come together? So we've tried to kind of talk this through. If you remember again, the low code, no code, the CX, UX, data, AI, ML, and process automation. And I would like to bring it through uh, to life through some of the examples that we have delivered to our uh, some of the departments or as a combination of some of the work we've done with our partners or some of the best in class examples could be done by another partner in the industry as well. I'll bring together, if I can just move to the next slide, please. Right, uh, three examples that I talked about. The first one, I would talk about the HMRC self-assessment. So if you look at um, the self-assessment, obviously from an, uh, from an individual citizen perspective, if, you, if you're a, a regular employee, I mean, there's a certain protocol, there's information that needs to come into HMRC from your payroll provider, from your organization, and some of the bank statements. And then there's a uh, amalgamation of the data. And when you fill it, there's a lot of backend validation. That's one side of the story. But small and medium businesses and who deal with HMRC also have a lot of information they need to file from the corporation tax or the taxes that they pay and the VAT, that information that need to flow in to HMRC. So what HMRC is doing is collecting this data silos from all third parties, bringing it all together so that when, when a business or an individual interacts, they don't need to worry about how the different data silos are integrating together to provide a very simple, seamless experience and not worry about saying some information is missing from one of the entities. So that causes a fulfillment of a specific tax filing or a tax calculation 
to go wrong and thereby having a downstream impact of a huge a citizen experience where you are calling them back, chasing them. So a simple integration could lead to downstream impact of a huge disgruntlement with the citizens. So that's one of the standard examples. So in this case, we use the low-code, no-code uh, layer. We use the API uh, through the API exposure. We use the process automation and we use the core data layer. So the three out of the five components were playing a very critical role. Obviously, it's the CX, UX, and the AI analytics continue to improvise the insight that was coming and saying, how do we continue to generate more stickiness into the application? So that's example number one. Example number two, which is slightly different with a very different variation. Traditionally, probably this also has to do with um, the seasonal variances were for pension claims and specifically pre post COVID and some of the recent changes in the wider economic impact. There's been a lot of pension claims that have been accruing into the system. And how do now uh, DWP bring together the best of the technology blocks that we talked about to create a huge backlog clearance so that citizens don't need to wait for a couple of years to get their claims sorted out or their queries sorted out? So traditionally, the uh, model that DWP uses is just hire another 100 or 20, 200 or 300 or 500 more agents get the backlog cleared. But however, with the lack of talent supply chain right now, it's nothing to do with the efficiency. It's just a sheer number of backlogs because of the macroeconomic factor. And because of the demand management that probably has gone rough, how do you ensure that you're bringing together again the components of the process automation, the data and, and the integration layer together with the AI here, because you're now also trying to analyze what kind of different claims, what demographics, what, what is the need, and you're able to prioritize and clear the entire backlog instead of hiring two, three, four, 500 agents, you're now doing through automation to deliver a best-in-class experience. So it's not an efficiency game. Again, it's an experience game. And the third and the most important one, which we love a lot about is the COVID pass, right? The, the, the two sides of the COVID pass, there's one is the whole process side in terms of setting up the governance, the processes around how will the different uh, inter departments and the third parties, which are largely in this case, handed over to uh, uh, through tenders to third parties, that information need to flow in through the, the NHS database and also integrated with the pharma firms in terms of what vaccine, what time it ships. So there's a huge backend number of different data silos that need to come together. It was an engineering feat on one side to bring this data into one seamless experience to produce a simple COVID vaccine passport for us to either enable travel or be required for us to move around in the, in the world that we lived in the last 24 months. So it's a great experience to enable a digital workflow but supported by underpinning data silos and a seamless orchestration between the different data silos. So we are very proud and we kind of orchestrated again, in fact, all the five uh, towers we talked about the process, the data, the AI, ML, and uh, the CX, UX along, which was a, a customer experience part, a simple certificate that need to come, required a huge heavy lifting. Again, you know, if this was to be done manually, could have, required thousands of people which was not available in a period of time that we were really going through this difficult period but this digital infrastructure and the architecture pulled together the best in class experience so those are the three examples i want to bring to life combined with all the various blocks that uh, that can drive a best in class citizen experience if i can just move to the next one please right ah uh, this is okay so probably preaching to some of the converted here in this case, a lot of times a digital transformation tends to be a technology project and that should not be the case. We strongly believe it's all outcome driven. And I, one of the reasons I love the domain compared to the commercial, the public sector is I think the outcomes are very and impacts each of us on this call to a large extent. And a lot of times these projects tend to kind of start off with some vision with no clarity and outcomes, but what is really important to deliver a specific outcome it's very, very important to define that right up front. And how do you then kind of scope a line and deliver the plan becomes the journey to which you want to uh, walk through to deliver these kind of uh, solutions. So that's the kind of narrative around this uh, specific slide. Most importantly, define your desired outcomes and make sure that you're uh, 
iteratively checking and constantly checking as you move through the journey. And it's it's funny as much as we talk about it as the most common sensical solution. We see it even today with a lot of departments in a rush to finish a specific technology project as against a project which can deliver a specific set of outcomes. I can step through the next one, Arunna, please. Right. Um, there are about kind of seven key blocks which which come together to deliver a successful transformation project, right? So it starts with exec sponsors, exec sponsors specifically at, at the, the civil servants at the highest level, all the way to the key sponsors who could be the funding agencies. In this case, some of them probably go back to the Whitehall uh, as required. Where we are funding these programs, it's very, very critical to have the sponsorship. We talked about the vision more from a vision, not from a, a, a statement perspective, but from a key outcomes that need to be aligned to the vision. The buy-in across the lines of business, we use very loosely in the corporate world, but applicable to each of the departments that you individually work in. And the fourth most important area is operating model, right? How are you setting up the governance? How do you make sure your benefits are being measured and outcomes are tracked? Coupled with the agility and gone are the days when you're doing a massive multi-million, multi-billion dollar program. I think the key question here is how do you ensure that um, we are able to kind of provide the agility to drive in, in uh, uh, ag agility to drive the outcomes in a very incremental small bites so that you're continuously delivering value. The last and the most important thing is transparency. I think this uh, fortunately, unfortunately, the time and information age where everything needs to be uh, published. There's a lot of uh, requirement for ensuring transparency. And most importantly, I think what the why kind of work that that's done in this division is tremendous Herculean effort and a lot of great impact. But often we see that it's less celebrated and what comes out in the public is those stats that you saw earlier. 63% not happy, 50% don't engage. But I think there are a lot of great work that I just talked about some of the COVID pass and other ones. The celebration of success is very, very critical. And these become uh, pretty important. So that's the that's kind of what you call the, the boundary areas on which any large successful transformation program to bring the best of automation of data and process together a lie upon. This could reflect, if somebody could argue, this could reflect for any large transformation program, and I would absolutely agree with that. But what's really important between a data process-led transformation versus any large transformation program would be one word here called the outcomes. So outcomes become the core foundation on which every program around automation on data and process kind of uh, hangs, its coat, uh, hangs its coat on. Sorry, let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, just kind of as I wrap up saying, what are the core found building blocks? We talked about the technology architecture. We talked about what are some of the use cases. We talked about how do you kind of put the various uh, guardrails around what are the various things you need to take into account. This slide kind of reiterates one of the messages that I gave you earlier about the agility, which is around how do you start the journey? How do you kind of create some quick successes at the same time, you're never losing sight of the destination. And I think it, it's a great uh, slide to kind of always say that, you know, as much as you want to achieve a billion dollar outcome or a huge nation, nationwide impact, move quickly into smaller chunks and continue to scale and repeat. I think that continues to be the mantra. The reason why this continues to be the, the way forward is because some of the technologies, as much as we say they're quite evolved, are not very mature to handle the kind of exceptions and the challenges that today uh, the organizations or the departments that each of you are facing in your respective uh, world. So the reason for trying this model is fail fast is what we typically use in a kind of a startup mode, which I think apply, applies very much in this world, is you apply, try something new, if the technology is fit for purpose, try a different model and continue to build on the uh, learnings that you had and as you continue to gain momentum, this kind of snowballs into huge organizational wide impact. And that's the kind of message that we have. Each of you would be at a different stage. I, I, I find it very interesting when I address a, 
a group like this, because each of you are at a very different stage of this maturity cycle. Some of you probably are the far right. You've really done there, been there, done that. You're saying, hey, why am I on this call? Some of you are probably just about starting and thinking, what does this really mean? How do I take it back to where I work? And how do I kind of really implement this as we go forward? With that said, I think if I can just move on to the next slide. Um, we started with the slide is saying there's been a lot of investment around the whole area of experience. We, we've spent enough on the customer experience, the, uh, the front end, the applications, the, the portals, et cetera. However, we saw the whole uh, thing interlocked or intertwined between processes and data. If you can just uh, double click, please. We kind of simplified with this architecture that we talked about the five code building blocks around data, AI, uh, low code, and the process automation, bringing it all together. We had a big web when we started the presentation. How do we kind of simplify this with this learnings, pull together smaller projects, agile, iterative in nature, we simplify this whole journey. Obviously, at the end of the day, we would expect, if we can just double click again, please. We would really expect very happy citizens, I'm sure, who engagement will get better. And each of us have to benefit because we probably formed part of that cycle as well. So with that said, I think uh, I probably uh, given you a good flavor of uh, where do organizations struggle? What are the building blocks to get this right? What are the various components of the journey? and how we can pull it all together to deliver these in bite-sized, but deliver large transformational benefits to our, our citizens, which end of the day kind of is a very vicious, positive cycle, uh, very, sorry, very positive cycle, uh, virtuous positive cycle, not the vicious positive cycle, which can help uh, continue to drive better customer experiences. I just want to state one word here. We've started this topic with automation and harmonizing data and process. We use the automation in a much broader brush context. Automation used for efficiency, effectiveness, and experience. We believe the narrative around automation between data and process for experiences brings significantly larger value and game-changing returns compared to a very narrow view of, can I bring efficiency? And is there anything that I can do to uh, chop, uh, chop the corners, which, which I don't think is a very nice way of starting a conversation around automation, but more a broad brush conversation around saying, how can we drive game-changing returns and value to our citizens who are day in, day out, interacting with, with a very complex backend system and simplifying that whole experience, I think brings the best uh, possible outcome from any automation initiative. With that said, uh, Robin, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Kuti. Um, yeah, we've got we've got questions and we've got about seven minutes. So let's get stuck in. If we can start sort of at the top, wanna um, and, and we'll kind of move we'll move down through this conversation, but who owns this challenge in your mind? Is it is it the IT department, the CIO, the CTO, or does it need to be in the boardroom with the chief exec? I think it's always uh, Robin. So my my, I've got a strong perspective, but you know, the people who like it. But what we have seen works well is what I won't share. It always better. We it starts at the boardroom, because as I said, those uh, seven key components uh, to put the guardrails around the transformation, the executive vision, the block one and two, the executive sponsorship and the vision are the most critical ones. So that has to be a top down. As much as the idea generation and the initiatives could be bottom up, but we strongly believe um, it needs to be top down driven because that makes people serious about the fact that this is the direction of travel and believe that there is the uh, management which will back them when something goes wrong. So that's that's my response. Yeah, no, air, air cover, I guess, as we call it. Very important. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you sort of I guess one of the challenges of that is that once you've got a sleek user experience, once you've got your Lamborghini with its beautiful interior, a lot of boards are going to think they've done the job. And of course, you're saying, no, you haven't. You're still going to end up stuck in traffic, to use your analogy. So um, how do you where do you start on that process? You said scale and repeat and sort of showcase small examples. I mean, how, how does that play out? 
Right. So the number of areas that it plays out, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, we just bring a, a group of uh, individuals together into a room. The number of ideas that come out of it are phenomenal. I think the human brain was evolved so much to identify challenges, right? We are all somehow wired to identify problems. But if you switch the whole conversation and allow people to come up with solutions, it's very interesting to see that a lot of us know the solution for our problems because it's just that we have a bias towards raising issues rather than focusing on the solutions. So when I say start small and focus on the significant set of process, each of us in our own domain, if we start writing down four or five core issues that I want to be automated because I know exactly when I have time pressure, I need something to be built. I need some insights around um, you know, my customers. I need to contact so many people, just get that insight. If only I had some automated solution where I could just query or interact and get that information, it would make my life probably saves me whole amount of time. And then I could spend that time with doing something more meaningful. So the best way is bring people together on a common ground, share some experiences. And when we pull the problems together, I think that's a great starting point for identifying the best solutions that can deliver best in class citizen services. You don't need to look outside. You don't need to look at what an Apple or a Google are doing to enable the solution. You can see how they would address this as a pattern. But a lot of time, I believe the answers lie within the organization themselves. Yeah. So where do you see organizations spending their time? So we, we've kind of agreed it's not going to be on the sleek user experience. So is it getting their data structured so that it's sort of usable and tells the truth and it's, is worth using or is it is it sorting out the processes or what's the balance? I think it's in the middle. If you see this picture, I think uh, we had another one which was a lot of uh, intertwining data and processes, right? I think a lot of us are stuck in that uh, loop. I'm sorry, we don't need to go back to that, but that's fine. We are probably stuck in that loop uh, or the mesh I call it, or the mess or the mesh that we call it. We basically, are spending a lot more time doing things that we can avoid. I, I, I would say, I would probably necessarily not use a Pareto principle, about 80% of our time goes in activities which don't add value and only 20% are adding value. If we can flip that uh, percentage, even by about 10 or 20 basis points, I think life can be fundamentally different for all of us. And we make easier for the, for the agents that are delivering services and for all of us, as well as citizens receiving the services. So that's the way I look at it. It's about flipping that conversation from saying problem focused to a solution focused and unlocking the value between uh, the process and the data that is stuck in this uh, whole mess. So and um, would you put process ahead of data? I mean, sort of you, really it's that change management that an organization needs as much Absolutely. as, as, much as um, sort of no code, low code platforms or, or whatever. No, it's absolutely critical. We, we, we probably didn't stress as much as the importance of the change management because uh, traditionally, as I said, whenever we talk about technology, digital project between automation and data and process, it kind of takes a negative connotation. I would rather switch the conversation saying, how do we make lives better? Where do we start? Change management is critical. To me, the change management is probably the 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 guardrails that you put around the road in terms of protecting the car and the, and the road, but both of them are equally important. So data and process need to come together. You may have the best in class car, but worst infrastructure, best in class infrastructure, but a very low performing car. So I, I would not get into the argument. I would say it's data and process rather than data or process. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. So, um, what are the top three challenges organizations face in driving better citizen experience? Excellent. So the first one is, I think, go back to your last question about the change management. There's a sense of, uh, you know, process and data automation simplifies journeys, but at the same time may cause some damage to the internal, uh, uh, internal teams in terms of redundancies, et cetera. I think the first thing is to take that out of the equation. So change in communication becomes the number one enabler for this. Enabler for this whole uh, challenge around what does this bring? Where does the value lie and how does it bring? So that's number one. The second biggest challenge is around um, 
specifically around the complexity that we have created. The world of data and process have been siloed for too far. So unlocking that complexity is the second biggest uh, challenge that I think the organizations face. And the third and the most important talent continues to be the biggest challenge as well. Robin, as much as we talk about uh, the growth and everything, it's important for organizations who are embarking on this journey to make sure that they are given the level of focus around talent that needs to be addressed to pull these pieces of the jigsaw together. It looks simple. Uh, I mean, it's very nice to talk about it, but unless you're the right people who can bring those pieces together at the right time in harmony, uh, I think it's it will continue to be a challenge. So those are the three challenges I think, and I've also talked about what can enable that uh, to get through that. Brilliant. Okay, I think that's a great moment to stop, um, Guti. So thank you so much. I think uh, some fabulous examples in there of kind of doing this thing at scale with HMRC um, and pensions. You know, some really sort of practical uh, experience that you've got at Cognizant, which is great, uh, great to see. Um, I really like the way you brought out those three elements of it and kind of address them head on um, as well. So um, it's been really valuable, I hope, for our audience. And I hope you've enjoyed giving the talk, Guti. And um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening.